I would like to introduce uh, my uh, uh, dear colleague, Professor Richard Finn, Professor of uh, Hematology Oncology, Geffen School of Medicine, California. Uh, and my pa panelist, Professor Hisham Al Ghazali, Professor Mohammed Abu Fatouh. Please, Professor Hisham and Professor Mohammed Abu Fatouh, you can introduce Professor uh, Richard Finn. Thank you. Professor Hisham, yes. Yes, um, um, very nice to, to, to have uh, one of the pioneers uh, in, uh, in HCC uh, worldwide, and uh, we will listen to a very important lecture about. Uh, the role of immunotherapy and how to position it in the first line, the second line, uh, and the practically which is the best uh, to use, and uh, especially uh, when we are talking to the Egyptian population, and you know that uh, HCC is uh, like the first cancer in, uh, in Egypt. Uh, so we will uh, listen carefully to Professor Fan, uh, and um, okay, the, uh, the, all the audience, uh, and all, all of us, we are waiting uh, this picture, and we will discuss with you later after you end the election. Thank you, Dr. Thank you so much. So everybody sees my screen? Yes? Good evening. Uh, it's morning here in Los Angeles, but thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'm very sorry we are not all together uh, celebrating, uh, but hopefully in a few months that will happen, uh, God willing. and. I thank you very much for the invitation again to talk about immunotherapy. As you heard in the, the talk just prior, very comprehensive discussion about sequencing and uh, the uh, uh, the about sequencing and the roles of the TKIs. Now, I've been in the liver cancer space for a long time uh, since joining the faculty here in 2003 with lab work and clinical work, and what an amazing evolution we have seen from going from uh, serafinib, which improved survival, but didn't induce objective responses, to then a host of new drugs from 2017 with the approval of regorafenib, and then linvantinib, and cabo, and ram, usirumab, and then accelerated approval of nevo and embro, to now, for the first time, a regimen that actually beats serafinib, something we've wanted to do for a long time. And We'll walk through some of that evolution, uh, how we got here. Here are some disclosures. So, you know, there's been many strategies to try to take advantage of the immune system to treat liver cancer for some time. Uh, all of you know that liver cancer uh, arises in a inflamed microenvironment. 90% um, of our patients have cirrhosis and therefore this inflammatory milieu uh, can alter the ability of the immune system to attack cancer through the development of tolerance uh, and immune exhaustion, uh, as well as the fact that the liver is an immune tolerant organ to start with, given its function in, in our bodies. But needless to say, there's been several approaches, either with vaccines such as dendritic cells, pulsed for alpha beta protein, uh, looking at things that are ablative and trying to stimulate an immune response that way. But clearly, I think today, when we talk about immunotherapy, we're talking about immune checkpoint blockade. Things like tremilumumab or devalumab, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, tremilumumab or ipilumumab, uh, which are antibodies to CTLA-4, which still are not approved in liver cancer, but do have approval, ipilumumab, uh, is approved in melanoma, and recently in combination, ipi and nivolumab, which is an anti-PD-1 antibody, was approved. And, and both these uh, targets, CTLA-4, PD-1, PD-L1, are designed to expose the tumor to the immune system. And you know, here is another diagram uh, looking at that. And, and there's several various important functions in activating immune response to a tumor. One is immune cell trafficking, which includes not only antigen presenting cells, but also uh, CD4 and CD8 cells trafficking through the uh, vasculature, getting into a tumor. And then there's complex regulation between the tumor and CD8 killer cells, including the CD8 cell interacting with the tumor itself, uh, as well as interacting with the tumor, uh, the antigen presenting cell, such as a macrophage. 
and PDL1 and PD1 expressed on the tumor and CD8 cells really are these down regulating signals that tell the immune system to pass the tumor. Uh, and my colleague here at UCLA, Tony Rivas, uh, played a, a big role in developing these drugs in melanoma. And we've been working with Tony for some time to try to bring these drugs into the uh, liver cancer landscape. Now, the first study of a checkpoint inhibitor in liver cancer was this study from Bruno Sangro in Spain of tremilumumab. It was a single arm study. Uh, and this study was published back in 2013. So the work was done, you know, 2010, 2011. And it was a single arm study patients with chronic hep C to get single agent trimilumumab to look at safety and early efficacy. And we saw some toxicity here. There was this fairly high frequency of increased AST and ALT, which I think caused us some concern in this group of patients who, uh, you know, have underlying liver disease. Now there was a signal of activity, you know, response rate, 18%. Interestingly, there was a drop in viral load, uh, which now we have better drugs for that, but uh, many patients had a drop in AFP. Median overall survival was about eight months, which in the second line setting at this time was not necessarily gangbusters, but needless to say, this drug did not move further ahead at the time in liver cancer. Then came this uh, paper from my colleague across town. I'm at UCLA and Anthony El Kahori is at USC, uh, friendly competition. Uh, but he did this, led this phase one study looking at nivolumab in various subgroups of patients who were generally pretreated, but there was a group that was untreated. And here you look at the waterfall plot and you can see that regardless of etiology, a number of patients had very deep responses. And, and based on this and what appeared to be a, a, a favorable safety profile, uh, the drug got approved, accelerated approval with the requirement to do a phase three study. Now response rates in the second line population were about 15% uh, in the full dose escalation group, about 20% uh, or the dose expansion group, I should say. And median overall survival was around 15 months. And so given this response of 15%, duration of response over 16 months, we got accelerated approval in the second line. And here you see the common side effects. And you can see that regardless of etiology, uh, high grade events, grade three, four, were not necessarily high, uh, certainly manageable, much less than that, uh, than what we saw with tremilumumab. Uh, certainly if we look at AST and ALT and, and liver toxicity, very manageable. And we also saw that PD1 or pd one expression did not correlate with response or survival. So last year, or I guess now two years ago at ESMO, uh, we saw this pivotal study of Nevo versus serafinib. This study was viewed as low hanging fruit, right? Serafinib we knew improved survival, and Nevo had this high response rate, very provocative. Seven, over 700 patients. And, you know, remarkably, this was a negative study. Now, you see here that Nevo had a survival of over 16 months, serafinib just under 15 months. This is the longest serafinib survival we've seen in a phase three study. And the hazard ratio is 0.85, but the p value of that was fairly close, 0.07. However, PFS was not significantly increased. Now, what this is suggesting to us is that there is a distinct subgroup of patients who get a benefit, but maybe if we can't identify them, you know, we can't improve survival. And, and what we confirmed here was that response rate with Nevo was, is high, 15% objective response rate, duration of response quite long. But compared to serafinib, which we know has a low response rate, the disease control rate was fairly similar because there's a number of patients who get stable disease and therefore their, their tumor is controlled. The other thing is we saw about 20% of patients on the serafinib arm at least went on to get IO at progression. You can't control what happens at progression. And as a frontline study, overall survival will be a function of subsequent treatments. And here you see those subsequent treatments as mentioned, uh, you know, 20% of patients got known IO, 
many of these investigational agents were IO as well. However, NEVO was very well tolerated. Here looking at adverse events in light color is low grade, in dark color is higher grade. And you can see that for the majority of these, NEVO was very well tolerated. Now, pembrolizumab underwent a very similar uh, development program, single agent in liver cancers of various etiologies, very similar response rate. Uh, we published earlier this year and presented at ASCO last year, Keynote 240, which was the pivotal phase three study for Pembro. As Pembro got accelerated approval and unlike nivolumab that went frontline, here we went second line with Pembro versus placebo. And this study actually read out before the pivotal NEVO study. And many of us, when we saw this result, figured the frontline study was at risk because Pembro could not beat placebo. Now, when I say not beat, it's a very interesting data set because response rate was 18%. Clearly, these drugs work in a subset of patients. And here you see the OS data, which was the, one of the primary endpoints, 10 and a half months versus 14 months, the longest survival in any second line phase three study. As the ratio is 0.78, upper limit of the confidence interval does not reach one, 0.998, and the p-value is 0.0238. Now, the caveat here, is because we had, had a few uh, interim looks at the data, interim analyses, and we had co-primary endpoints, we had to lower the p-value for this to be statistically significant. And clearly 0.01 uh, was not reached with this p-value 0.02. But again, I think both these studies indicate that these drugs work in patients with liver cancer uh, and probably have been susceptible to clinical trial design. Now, with Keynote 240, we did see that we prolonged TTP. And you can see here a clear flattening of the curve of a group of patients who don't progress. So if we look at the monotherapy studies, we can see we're seeing fairly similar uh, response rates, certainly in uh, larger studies as the studies got larger, 18 20% with Nevo or Pembro in first or second line. So if we don't have a biomarker for response, one strategy has been to increase response rates. Because if we can increase response rates, perhaps we can improve survival. And here is some of the rationale for combining VEGF inhibition with PD-1 or pd one targeting. And it goes to one of those first slides I show that angiogenesis does more than starve a tumor of a blood supply. It does affect the immune microenvironment that can bring in immune effector cells that can then be uh, promoted to attack a tumor with a drug like te tezolizumab. And we had interest in, in bevacizumab many years ago in liver cancer, but because of concerns of bleeding, it never really took off. Now, the pivotal study was a tezo versus bev versus serafinib. This was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in May of this year. And this was an open label study, a global study of a tezo bev versus a serafinib, very clear uh, clinical trial design, co-primary endpoints of OS and PFS and child PUA patients. Now, all patients needed to have an upper endoscopy within six months to rule out any high-risk bleeding varices. The study was well-balanced. Majority of patients came from outside of Asia by design, all child PUA, majority child uh, Barcelona C, but there were a subset of patients with intermediate disease who progressed on TACE or were TACE ineligible. And here you see other characteristics, a fairly high risk population with over 70% of patients having vascular invasion or extrapatic spread and a typical distribution of HCC etiology. So this study was stopped at the first interim analysis with a medium follow-up of about eight and a half months because clearly the survival curves separate early and remain separated. So Rafnib had a median survival of 13 months at this time, we still had not reached the median with a tezobev, but the hazard ratio here was 0.58. Remember, the hazard ratio for serafinib versus placebo from the SHARP study was 0.69. So the first time, a combination regimen versus the active control is markedly improving survival, the most important endpoint. Now, that is underpinned by this improvement in PFS. Here, a hazard ratio is 0.59, very similar to the uh, OS data. And 
for the first time in a phase three study, we have response rates that are fairly high. 27% confirmed response by, by independent review. Uh, here, Serafina, 12%, perhaps the highest response rate in a phase three study. But needless to say, the disease control rate was 74% versus 55%. And if you respond, the duration of response is quite long. Now, overall, adverse events were very similar between both arms, including grade three, four events. Grade five events, also very similar, if not a little worse than serafinib. There were more SAEs with the combination as defined here, as well as requiring to withdraw drugs, slightly higher, 15.5% versus 10%. Now here, looking at the most common adverse events. Now you can see there aren't really any surprises here with uh, hypertension being the most common adverse event with uh, bevacizumab, uh, a little higher grade than we see with serafinib. Uh, but if we look at things like fatigue, similar between the two, proteinuria, a known effect of both drugs, but higher with the tezobev. We look at GI toxicity, higher with serafinib, clearly something that can affect quality of life. Uh, so, you know, if we look at all adverse events, generally uh, well tolerated. Now, there were more bleeding events with the tezobev, but those were generally low grade. And here we see. Uh, Again, similar to the nivolumab plot, whoops, sorry about that. Uh, Atezobev in light, low grade, and dark, higher grade, and clearly more adverse events in general with serafinib arm. However, here you see hypertension, a little different, infusion reactions, and proteinuria. Now, treatment-related adverse events carry a very similar uh, observation. You can see here now rash and hand-foot syndrome, much of uh, a bigger problem with serafinib as well as diarrhea. Now, looking at serious adverse events, uh, here you see those that occur in more than 2% in each arm, and you can see that bleeding events are higher with a tezobev, uh, 2.4. So this is about 5% here if we include GI bleeds and what we call variceal bleeds. Uh, that's about 5% versus 2.5% with serafinib. However, the incidence of having a serious bleeding event or bleeding, uh, dying of a bleeding event is still fairly uncommon in this population. So I think as you heard from the prior lectures, a tezobev for most patients will become the standard of care. Single agent TKIs uh, certainly are an option frontline for patients, but I think we really need to find a reason not to give a tezobev given uh, the favorable safety data and efficacy data. And I did not show, but all quality of life readouts favored that combination as well. Now, looking to the future, the combination of Lymvantinib and Pembrolizumab looks very promising. Uh, we published this in JCO just this month. And you can see here in this 100 patient phase 1b study, response rates were 36%. Median duration of response was over a year. And this response rate looks very similar to the response rate we saw in the single arm at Tezobev study. Uh, and the toxicity with this really looks very similar to the toxicity we saw with uh, uh, either lenalone or Pembro alone. And the LEAP002 study has completed accrual. This is Len Pembro versus Lenvantinib or placebo. Uh, this study is powered for overall survival and PFS co-primary endpoints, and we're waiting for those results. At the same time, CTLA-4 and PD-1 inhibition, ipilimumab and nivolumab was looked at, uh, and this study was actually just published yesterday, I think, in JAMA Oncology. Uh, and this looked at various arms from the Checkmate 040 study, very consistent response rates of 30%. Interestingly, for some reason in this dosing structure, a survival uh, was much longer than in the other arms. But needless to say, this regimen was chosen to move forward and was FDA approved based on accelerated approval mechanisms. Uh, and there's now a phase three study of ipinevo versus serafinib. And finally, tremulumumab has come back. Uh, tremi is now being looked at with the pd one inhibitor dervalumab. Again, uh, if we look at uh, data presented at ASCO, 
we have response rates of 25% in the second line setting, 18% uh, confirmed, 25% unconfirmed. Uh, but needless to say, this is a very exciting data set. This has actually been updated at ASCO by Katie Kelly and response rates are in the 25% range when we use a larger cohort. And this regimen is being looked at in the frontline setting of Dervatremi versus Serafinib. Uh, this is a completed accrual, again, powered for OS, a very large study, 1,200 patients, looking at the combination versus single agent Derva versus Serafinib. And ongoing is the cabozantinib and atezolizumab study frontline. So as you heard, CAB was approved second line. It's being moved in the frontline setting in this combination. Uh, not a lot of data presented yet of this combination, uh, but the study's ongoing. And last, there's a lot of interest in combining checkpoint inhibitors with local regional treatment. This study from the MCI, NCI of tremilumumab and TACE or RFA. So it's a very interesting study where just doing this pace or RFA could stimulate an immune response. We saw some evidence of an abscopal effect. Uh, and, and this idea is now being tested in several phase three studies with various checkpoint inhibitors. So many of us view now the sequence being Tezobab frontline, and then without any data per se to in indicate the correct sequence, but then using serafinib, levantinib as frontline TKIs and then sequencing other TKIs. And importantly, to get the best effect from all this, really we need to transition patients to systemic treatment at the right time. We can't wait till they decompensate uh, and, and transition them when appropriate. So these are my conclusions for the sake of time. I'll, I'll stop talking. Uh, I wanna thank you all for having me, uh, but what an exciting time in liver cancer to have so many options for our patients. Uh, and I think maybe there's some time for questions or discussion. Again, thank you very much. I hope you're all well and that we're together soon. Um, thank you, Richard, uh, for this comprehensive uh, presentation. And the floor is open for questions. Let me start with my, by myself. Uh, we have data from the celestial study about deterioration from child A to child B during treatment, and we have data on the results. Do we have similar data on the atezobev? Uh, you know, we will probably be presenting that in the future. Uh, and your, your question is, what is their child Pew score at progression? Was that your question? Yes. Yeah, I don't think... Uh, uh, that's been presented yet. I'm trying to think if we put that as an addendum in the New England Journal paper, uh, and I'd have to check offhand. Graham, do you feel that uh, it is important to, to look to the response rate, especially in the locally advanced tumor uh, and patient with the portal vein thrombus? So, um, you feel that it is important to choose the line of treatment according to the response rate in some time? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, you know, I, I think that the IO agents work by largely in, inducing a response, but also the stable disease patients get a benefit. And, and we showed certainly in the Keynote 240 data set that the, uh, the drugs work not just by improving response rate, but also shifting more patients from progressors into stable disease. So, you know, I think the more important thing to me in considering sequencing is what drug they have not had or what mechanism of action have they not had. So, you know, if someone's best response frontline to a Tezobev is stable disease, and then they develop progression, I, I think I would look at going to a TKI, maybe something like uh, Linvantinib or Serafin. Um. I, I got a question about uh, the anti-drug antibody. As you know, uh, these is the highest uh, uh, IO that would produce anti-drug antibody. What is the clinical impact on the treatment? Yeah, that's that's been asked a lot lately, right? And I think there's a few things. One, I don't know that it's been shown that these anti-drug antibodies affect efficacy, right? Uh, 
you know, it all depends where the antibody binds, uh, this anti-drug antibody, number one. Number two, there's no clinical test for it. And at this point, I think it does not have any clinical relevance. It's of academic interest, I think. Uh, Professor uh, Richard Finn, I'm Professor Mohammed Yassin. How are you? Good, good. Yes. Uh, my question for you is, uh, do you think we have to do uh, new trials in second line because all the trials have been done after uh, serafinib uh, progression? So do you think we have to, or, or is it a waste of, of time to do other researches after progression of atezolizumab? Because we are in a new era right now, what to do after progression of atezolizumab? Because the, 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 the whole landscape was after progression of serafinib. Yeah, so an excellent question, a very practical question. So I would say no, you know, it's a waste of time and resources because I don't know what we're gonna prove. Uh, yes. It would take a very long time, a very large study. I mean, this came up even with the approval of Linvantinib, right? Because that was even approved before Tezobab. And in other diseases, when we make progress, because that's what we're talking about, we're making progress, we don't go back and repeat everything to figure out how best to sequence. That comes maybe from real world data or observational cohorts. Uh, but I, I think what we can say is that we've proven all the drugs, at least in phase three studies, we've proven that they're anti liver cancer drugs and that they improve survival. Uh, and then it becomes a leap of faith to say that it doesn't matter what came before them, right? We just know they help improve survival. Uh, and you could say like another project I was involved with in, in the breast space with CDK inhibitors, right? These got approved very quickly, moved to front line. So does that mean we just ignore everything we've known for all this time? Uh, no, and, and we can't repeat everything. It's actually an interesting question. Let's just see. Yes, so uh, Professor Richard, if we uh, uh, start with atizubib and then there is progression. Can we give surafenib, limbatinib, and vice versa? If we start with surafenib or limbatinib and there is progression, can we give atizubib for second line? So do you believe in this sequence uh, according to progression? Yeah, that's a great question. So the first part I think is easy and you presented data and, and the other speakers that, you know, after atezobev, we're not just gonna stop, right? We have all these drugs available. And I think in my thinking, and I can't say it's necessarily better than other people's thinking, but I would go to frontline TKI, right? Things that have been proven to be a frontline TKI, serafinib, or lenvan. Now, can you do vice versa? So I think this is a fair question. And, and personally, and again, I don't have data, you know, in this sequence, but I would say yes, because this is what we're saying is that, you know, maybe we didn't have a tezobev at the time and a patient with star on serafinib, and then a tezobev gets approved. Personally, I don't think it's fair to deny that patient a chance of getting a benefit from a tezobev. And I don't know that we have evidence that it doesn't work after serafinib. If anything, if we look at the uh, Nevo data, the Pembro data, these drugs are active second line. Uh, and if we had a response rate of 27%, maybe those studies would have been positive. So personally, I would offer it to a patient if they qualify. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what about the uh, patient with uh, esophageal viruses? Do you exclude them from the study or do you manage them first? What, do, what is your practice? Excellent question. Uh, so the study only excluded them if they were at high risk of bleeding, right? If they had them managed, they could come on study. Uh, and so now we go into the real world, right? And, you know, I think it depends on uh, the patient, right? I mean, if someone had an endoscopy 10 months ago and it was fine, I'm not gonna in practice repeat an endoscopy. Uh, you know, if there's a patient with liver cancer that never had an endoscopy, then they should probably have one. Do we need to stop, wait until their first day of drug? You know, if, if it takes 10 days to get an endoscopy, uh, does it matter if they start a few days before? Uh, personally, I don't think so. You know, Bev is not is not uh, a blood thinner. You know, it's not a it's not heparin, right? Its effect on bleeding is biologic by its effect on the vasculature and perhaps hypertension. Uh, so I think in practice we should get endoscopies before starting. Uh, and if a patient 
has recent bleeding or their varices are not well controlled, then obviously you need to give it pause because uh, we know that there is an increased risk. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Richard, for this very nice presentation and also discussion. And I think it's important to communicate with you uh, because to discuss even the patient, the Egyptian patient with different genotype uh, and how to this to be implemented in uh, international study. Thank you very much, uh, all the speakers, Professor Yassin and all the panelists. Thank, Thank you, you and see you in the next. Thank you.